solar panels are getting cheaper and cheaper and that's great and more and more of us are using them to power our sheds run our pond pumps and even to turn camping into glamping the trouble is there's a bewildering array of types and styles and makeups what's the right one for you today we'll help you find out Hello, welcome to English Country Life. And I think we can say that spring is definitely here. My name's Hugh, and together with the fantastic Fiona, I run a small holding here in rural Lincolnshire. And part of running a small holding is cutting down your bills. And we've become more and more interested in solar recently, particularly as the prices have been getting much, much more affordable. The trouble is, it can be quite a complex subject. So recently we did a simple introduction to home solar and a lot of people seem to have quite enjoyed it. We described all the basic components and how they fit together. And people have asked for more, so here we are. Today we're going to look at panels and the choice of panels can be bewildering but my goodness they've got cheap now. But the trouble is when somebody sort of says to you do you want monocrystalline or polycrystalline? Do you want folding or fixed or, you know, it just becomes this kind of whole bunch of questions you don't know the answer to. So today we're going to go through it in a straightforward, simple, plain English way and help you find the right panels for you. Right, to make panels understandable, we're going to break it down into several sections. We're going to look at the technology, then we're going to look at how they're put together, the physical format of them. So let's do technology first. And there's basically only four types to worry about. First two, monocrystalline and polycrystalline. Inside the panel, as we covered in our first episode, is a bunch of silicon diodes. And they make the panel work. In a monocrystalline, all of this is cut from a single crystal of silicon. In a polycrystalline, it's multiple ones put together. And the monocrystalline is far more efficient than the polycrystalline ones. So monocrystalline panels will produce more electricity for the same area than a polycrystalline. Sometimes the polycrystalline look cheaper, but they're not because they aren't as efficient. They don't produce as much electricity for your buck. Third kind is a specialist type of panel and it's called a thin film panel and they're flexible. They sort of look like this, flexible panels. What are they good for? Well, we'll look at that when we come on to the physical form of them. They're not as efficient as the monocrystalline, but they do have their uses. And the fourth song that I want to talk about is something called PERC, P-E-R-C. Don't worry about what it stands for, it's a lot of gibberish words. But what it means is it's a way of making a panel even more efficient. So what happens with a PERC panel is the light passes through the silicon on the way in and the silicon gathers a load of the energy, but then it bounces back, it reflects and goes back out through the panel and it gets a second bite at the cherry, a second opportunity to extract power from that amount of sunshine. So that means it actually works more efficiently and can generate more power. It also means the panel stays cooler and that helps efficiency too. So perk panels are good. This is a rigid solar panel. It's a heck of a thing, it's 400 watt size and this is bigger than me. It weighs over 20 kilos and it's solid. But for a permanent installation in the same place, on your shed roof, on your home, etc., this is what you want because it's not going to flap around in the breeze and damage itself. It's going to sit where you put it, solid as a rock. And bang for your buck, these rigid panels are much, much cheaper than flexible or folding panels. This is a folding panel. They're brilliant for things like camping and caravanning. It's another big multi hundred watt unit, but you can just fold it up and put it in the boot of your car when you're done with it, which with the rigid panel we looked at earlier wasn't possible. Now the rigid panel uses that monocrystalline type of panel that I was telling you about before and it holds a lot of glass. This is a thin film panel and therefore is much more resilient to being moved around. This is a flexible panel. They're really good, but they do bend. They're not as technically efficient as the rigid monocrystalline panels, but they have their place. And that place is often installing them on vehicles. They get used a lot on things like motor caravans and narrow boats because the surface that you're fitting them to isn't always flat. With one of these, you can bend the panel to fit the surface. It's also the panel we're going to look at in our next section where we try and get the most out of the panel by orienting it to the sun. Let me show you a bit of shed bodgery that I built that might illustrate one of the interesting things about the best place to site your solar panels. And this is it. 
is made of an old telly bracket, a fence post and a paving slab. So it's really, really high tech, but it actually does help illustrate part of the problem that we've got. So whatever your installation, whether it's a permanent one or a temporary one, because you're using it for camping or for emergency use, you need to point your solar panels right at the sun to get the best efficiency. You want the sun to come in and hit your panel square like that. You don't want it coming in from massively above or you don't want it coming in from one side. So we put a TV bracket on this so that we can actually angle the panel towards the sun. And here's your challenge. You're in, to the south of me. In the winter, the sun here barely gets above the horizon and it creeps around like that. In the summer, it can be directly overhead, but always it starts in the east and moves round to the west. And with a setup like this, you can literally change the angle of the panel and track it through the day. Now, obviously with a permanent setup, you can't do that, but you want to find the place where it's closest to the average angle that that sun's gonna come in at in the different seasons and the different times of day. With a camping setup or an emergency setup, what I'm saying to you is find a way of keeping your panels at an angle and move them around in the day so they're always pointing towards where the sun's coming from. And it really will increase your efficiency. I wanna to touch briefly on how to get the right size and amount of solar panels for what you need. This that we use, that's a 20 watt panel, in theory, on a bright sunny day, when there's no shadows on it, when the sun's high in the sky. And basically under ideal circumstances, it produces 20 watts. When it's winter and the sun is really low in the sky and there's loads of cloud and you know the shadows falling across the panel, it will produce far, far less. So be aware that the wattage shown on the panel is not its inevitable output, that is the most it's ever going to produce. So you have to size your panels for how you want to use them and what time of year you want to use them to get the right output. Here's another point. In our first episode, we covered the fact that you need to basically connect your panels up to one of these. This is a charge controller. So you connect the panel to the charge controller, the charge controller to the battery, and the charge controller will not let the panels overcharge or damage the batteries. And that's very important. But there's a limit to the input that the charge controller can take. And it'll be listed with the unit. It'll say how many watts it can take, how many amps it can take, and what's its maximum voltage. And you mustn't put more into it than the charge controller can take. We will cover charge controllers in detail in another video, but that's an important limitation. So that's what matters for a sort of permanent home setup. For a camping setup, you're likely to use one of these instead. This is a power station, and I wanted to cover this after we talked about the basic components, because really what a power station is, is a charge controller, a battery, and an inverter that turns that stored energy into mains power in a handy dandy box with some input and output sockets. That's all it is. People think it's some kind of voodoo magic, but it's the same stuff you've got in your home setup, just in a handy portable setup. And you can quite literally take your solar panel, take your power station, plug it in the back and blow me down, that's charging. Look at that, isn't that simple? but you've got to have the right size panel for your power station. And if you look in the literature that comes with it, your power station will tell you, but again, don't put too big a panel on, otherwise you'll damage your power station. So that's our little power bank. We love it. When we were away from the mains, it means we can have a bit of light, we can charge our phones, all kinds of things like that, really useful. But do they come any bigger? Well, of course they do. Look at this one. This is a beast. That thing will run your freezers or even your washing machine or possibly even most of your house during a power cut. It's got a monster battery in it but of course once you get up to bigger sizes you start getting to that question of I need more power to recharge it. Can I have more than one panel? Yeah you can but there's some wiring choices there. Let me illustrate the choices that you've got. Right these are high-tech 
AA batteries. And I'm sure we've all had them in a torch where we drop one on top of the other inside the torch. So the positive of that battery hits the negative of that one. That's called wiring in series. And AA batteries are one and a half volt. But when you wire them in series, two of them together like that, you've got the same amount of current, but it's three volts. There is a different way of wiring them though. You can wire them side by side so that the two positives connect, the two negatives connect. If you do that, you've only got a one and a half volt battery, but you've got twice as much current. Let me show you the difference that makes. They're back. These are the Squirty Bottle Electrical Circuit Illustrators. What are we going to show you? Well, two batteries side by side, one hand on each to squeeze them. You get two streams of current. That's a parallel circuit, double the current, same voltage. But if we put both hands on, what's going to happen is we only get one stream of current, but it's getting squeezed a lot harder. So we've got double voltage, same current. That is a series circuit. So which ones do we prefer, parallel or series? Well, there's some real advantages to parallel wiring. So you've got your two streams of current going from your parallel panels. One panel falls into shadow, you're still getting current from the other one. Or one panel develops a fault, you'll still get current from the other one. When you wire in series, all the current is passing through all the panels, they're all connected one after another. Any panel hits a problem and either the whole lot gets throttled back or cuts out altogether. So that's the drawback of wiring in series, but there is a major advantage of wiring in series. When you wire in series, the current doesn't grow and the limitations on most systems are about the wiring. Most wiring can only take a certain amount of current. Increasing the voltage, not a problem. Increasing the current can overload the wiring. If you put too much current through wiring, it can heat up and even catch fire. Let me just prove that. This is long, fine strands of wire, known as wire wool. This is just a basic nine volt battery. And it will put a charge through them when the two terminals touch the wire wool. Let's see what happens. That wire wool is now on fire. It's actually burning because the excess current has caused it to reach a temperature where metal burns. And that's what happens if you put too much current through a wire. So that's a roundup of basic information about the types of solar panels that exist and how to put them together. And whilst there's quite a lot of information there, it resolves itself into a couple of scenarios quite easily. For me, a fixed setup in or around the home on a garden shed or, you know, on the home itself, you're looking at rigid panels probably going into a charge controller then into a set of batteries and then into an inverter and that provides you with a scalable setup for home use. For more flexible and portable use then I think flexible panels that fold up together with a power station can provide you with materials that can be packed up, moved and put away again. But in both scenarios you've got to size your panels to your charge controller or to your power station to ensure that you're putting in a safe and logical amount of current and voltage. We are planning to do a short series of these videos and in future ones we can look at things like the different types of charge controllers, the different types of batteries and also how to put things together in a way, for example, to power water pumps which we've been asked about for irrigation purposes and there's a lot of things where we can say if I wanted to do that this is the setup I'd put together and if you've got anything in mind a setup you'd like to see us explore let us know what it is down in the comments or any other questions you've got on the self-sufficient life and we'll try and include them in future videos if you'd like to see those videos and everything else we produce tap on subscribe down there and the bell next to it you get told every time we upload a new video and that's a completely free service and if you've enjoyed today's we'd be really grateful for a thumbs up but for now thanks for joining us come back and see us soon Take care.